Um, okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the, today's event, Anticipating Extreme Crises and Disruptions, Developing a National Risk Management Strategy. My name is Anna Lukasevich, and I am the Senior Project Officer at the Australian National University's Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions, um, ISETS for short. Um, as some of you know, ISETS is the new consolidated institute uh, comprising of the former Climate Change Institute, the Energy Change Institute, and the Disaster Risk Science Institute. So I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of this land um, and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal nation, both past, present and emerging. I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in attendance today and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, a little brief admin note before we begin. Um, the audience can submit questions at any time through the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and you can also vote for other people's questions by cl clicking the thumb, uh, thumb up signs, uh, sign at the bottom of the question. Um, in the discussion after the presentations, I will uh, put as many of the questions as we have time uh, to the speaker prioritizing those which have the most votes. And for the benefit of those who can't join us live tonight, this event is being recorded, which means that all comments and questions in the Q&A will be recorded also. And our speaker has graciously said that he will attempt to answer um, all the uh, questions, um, even after the event, if we run out of time. Um, so on that note, let us begin. Our speaker today is Dr. Paul Barnes. Paul is a research fellow in urbanization and disaster resilience at the Institute of Global Development at the University of New South Wales and a senior fellow in risk and resilience at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. He has experience in specialist roles in emergency and risk management at both state and federal levels and as a tenured academic. Thank you and over to you, Paul. Thank you, Anna, and it's a great privilege to be with ANU uh, discussing these important topics. Uh, one of the critical things that I think Australia faces is that uh, emergencies that then can cascade up to disasters and full-blown societal crises uh, will not wait in line. And they will follow sometimes uh, on the close heels of the previous disaster. Seasonally, we've had bushfires and floods across Australia, certainly to the north of Australia, but more recent times with pandemic events, et cetera, uh, and cascading uh, socio-technical events and economic impacts from trade issues and rather large ships, for example, blocking the Suez Canal uh, is an, an example of how global systems impact on national systems and the well-being of people within a country. So what I'd like to do is I could just start sharing the screen with you. Um, some slides that I would like to uh, offer to the group. Now, I presume everybody can see that because I can see that myself. So if I could have an, a nod from somebody, uh, possibly Anna, that everything's working, we can proceed. You can't see them yet, Paul. Um, maybe we should just double check. So go down to share screen again and see if it's... How was that? Yeah, that's looking better. Um, okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Always good to have the technical issues rumpled and flattened first. So may I suggest to the audience that the challenges of thinking about risk ahead of even considering a strategy or techniques for assessing risk, there are three major issues and they cascade through a range of particular domains that are of relevance to us. Complexity of phenomena within the causal space of, of what may occur in terms of a disturbance or a, a major threat situation, uncertainty about the effects, uncertainty about the early onset of, of phenomena, and certainly uncertainty about the data that may be part of a decision-making cycle. And the overarching issue of ambiguity who mean who understands what is is a technical approach to the issues going to be the same as 
a community or a family group who are experiencing danger, they're experiencing different things to what a management group would be looking at, say at a local government, state or federal government context. So there are critical elements of uncertainty and certainly as we move forward, the sorts of issues that Australia faces historically, floods, fire, weather patterns, dust storms, have, have been a perennial issue and certainly in the East Coast and, and uh, over years and over time. We currently have pandemic problems. Some of you may have received your AstraZeneca or maybe you've been receiving a Pfizer vaccine, but the critical issue here is that we have a human health disaster, an emergency, a pandemic that is again, has been planned for and thought about consistently in Australia and in most economies of the planet. But when they manifest, sometimes the reality of these phenomena go beyond the planning and preparation for them. But we shouldn't forget that there is biosecurity issues, certainly from a terrorist perspective on this slide you see on the left hand side of the screen, but also from a biosecurity and animal health perspective and foot and mouth disease is referenced here. Australia has a very, very comprehensive foot and mouth disease emergency plan, but a critical thing of the point I'm trying to make today is that if Australia is wanting to be on the front foot and effective from a strategic perspective, from a risk management perspective, looking at all hazards, all threats, animal health, human health, the One Health collaboration, also food security has to be at the forefront of thinking and not just segmented within uh, excellence areas within government that have specific responsibilities for these pillared threats. We shan't, can't always forget also, we shouldn't forget that with emergent technology, these technologies come with a double edge. You can do amazing things with new biotechnology and synthetic biology uh, technologies. But at the same time, if you look at this particular image for a hundred American dollars, you can download and purchase, I should say, a kit that allows you to adjust E. coli bacteria in the comfort of your own kitchen to make it less uh, responsive to drugs. They show you how to change the, the, the uh, genotype or the genotypic expression of E. coli that comes to you in little, uh, little uh, test tubes as part of the kit you purchase. And you have instructions of how to use the CRISPR technologies to change the E. coli. Again, this is a interface between technology, commerce, and the potential third part of that triangle is what could be done with the technology in the wrong hands or in the hands of somebody who is just exploring the technology. But the complexity of the issues, certainly in the pandemic world we currently face and broader biosecurity is exemplified in this image. If we look at the potential for disease to begin in humans, animals, or plants, may I suggest, and this is coming back to 2003, a lot of technology has gone into looking at threat assessment from a very comprehensive perspective. If we change social, political and economic factors, that will either increase or decrease the likelihood that there will be a disease causation process triggered. If we change the genetic and biological factors, the evolutionary pressures that may manifest in the biological open environment, that also will influence the likelihood of a disease beginning in either the human or animal or plant host. If we change the physical environmental factors, if we change the ecological factors, all of the complexity, as in the first slide, that we are, there is ambiguity, there's complexity involved in thinking about risk issues. So just in the biological world of disease causation, there is complexity, intense complexity. So may I suggest to the group that there, in terms of disruptive events, events that occur that we assess the likelihood and consequence of, there are probably three core questions that could be done uh, in, in our thinking. What could happen? How might those things happen? And what might those impacts be? And how could they be mitigated? Again, you can't attenuate the effect unless you understand elements of the cause and how likely the events will be, the disruptive events in this case. But if we look at international standards, the ISO 31000, refers to uh, risk as a compound phenomena related to the effect of uncertainty on meeting objectives. Now, it's a comprehensive overarching position, 
but there are a number of notes within the standard that allude to likelihood and consequence relationships as critical to understanding future disturbance, future events. Some call risks. I prefer to come back to the standard and work with the technicality of a likelihood and consequence relationship. Mediated by vulnerability, mediated by a range of pre-existing conditions within technical systems, social systems, etc. So the complexity that we have to deal with is in some cases the techniques related to risk assessment are very complex and they sometimes rely on data. So a challenge that we face in approaching national risk issues everywhere, but certainly in Australia, is what do we do when data and explanatory frameworks don't, you, don't help at all? So in this particular image, we have a, basically a Johari window for two quadrants, two by two, with a few extra elements. So if we have shaky probability or shaky bases for probabilities, numbers, we have some suggested techniques. If there's no probability phenomena there, there's no basis for estimating an accurate number in terms of probability as an expression of likelihood, what could we do? Scenario analysis, looking at future settings. Again, if we look at the future context here, we have to have a really complex picture of the phenomena or the systems that we're dealing with. And because normal systems that we live in, humans, the biological environment, we are dealing with complex adaptive systems, our scenario analyses have to be very sophisticated, may I suggest. If we have limited knowledge about the outcomes, the endpoints of any particular assessment that we want to do, we would probably want to have some fuzzy logic analysis or precaution in the, in the sense of the precautionary principle. It's better to be sure before we step forward onto thin ice, for example. But again, there are many different approaches to using the concept of risk professionally. Uh, again, looking from the left, from insurance all the way through to cultural anthropology. Different professional approaches to managing risk, let alone assessing risk, will be cognizant and impacted by the different professional approaches. Now, this image is a little a uh, little busy, it's available for you uh, if you wish to be downloaded, I'm sure. These slides will be available, but it's based on the fact that there are different approaches to assessing future impacts, depending on the natural, uh, the professional group that's doing it. Now, if there's a group of professionals working together, there could be a meta language problem in terms of definition and terminology, but the complexity of assessing risk and therefore the importance of getting risk management strategies correct is suggested here that we have to be very careful of the different skill sets of the professional groups that will be working together, hopefully as, as a team. And we've seen a lot of teams come together in the early COVID days last year in ways that Australia may not have ever seen before other than in times of war. Uh, state and national cabinets working together, premiers and prime ministers working together. Again, if we downgrade that particular factor to professional groups working together, we need to be sure that terminology is a, a factor that is considered very, very, very carefully. Sorry, I jumped ahead. I'll just try and get the next slide. Uh, what should we be worried about? That's another challenge. This image comes from Canadian work looking at what they consider a threat topology, sources of disturbance that can then have the effect being assessed on likelihood and consequence. They separate malicious threats, criminal foreign state actors against non-malicious threats, being social, technological, accidental issues, health from large-scale contamination events, biological or chemical, epidemics, pandemics. They also emphasize naturally sourced disturbances, climate, weather variability certainly would be one of those. And they're looking also at, uh, say, pestilence, the effect of pests, increasing warming impacting on biological systems. The last box at the bottom is very interesting. Emerging phenomena, emergent technology, the effects of technologies that may be counterintuitive, counter things that we didn't expect technologies to do, or effects from use of the technology, or the effect of people using a technology in ways that was never deemed to be a problem reference back to the CRISPR kits that you can buy online and do unusual things with. So the Canadian government 
have a threat topology, a lens by which they look at national issues, that then they can apply national thinking and decision making too. So a challenge for Australia is what should we be worried about, may I suggest? So what might a risk management strategy do for us? An eminent uh, researcher from many years ago, Mintzberg, suggested that strategy and strategic thinking is more about synthesis than connecting the dots. It's more, it's more about what it is we have to try and do, the sort of surprises we, try to, we should try to limit rather than the techniques we apply to be more aware. The techniques are important, but they have to be guided by overall thinking and strategic uh, intent. So the strategy is a pattern, stream of decisions, plans developed with the future in mind, but with the past also central to that thinking. So from a natural disaster perspective, sorry, natural hazards perspective and the disasters that em uh, emanate from these phenomena, we've had a bushfire Royal Commission, we've had many lessons learned and events, post-event analyses over many years. So there's a very large database of information just from the natural hazards perspective let alone the socio-technical elements. How do we look at our infrastructure systems? How do we enhance the resilience to disturbance from natural hazards to those systems? So we have to look forward, but we have to be cognizant of what we have experienced in the past. So revisiting the early ideas of what could happen, has the phenomena happened before and under what conditions could it appear again? How might these disturbances happen? Do direct or indirect causal phenomena exist that could increase the likelihood of that disturbance occurring? Not necessarily the natural hazard phenomena, but the cascading impacts from that. In some cases, we may find that there is a disturbance or an event that manifests without early warning, or at least we haven't been attentive to those warnings. How might the impacts be mitigated? And this is where workforce planning, capability assessments have to be considered. Do we have the skills for intervention? Do we understand the skill sets? It may not be a specialised skill set. It may be a hybrid collective skill set. Are the required capabilities, capacities known and to what scale do we need to invest now for future capability? Cap capacity is a critical issue, certainly if we're surging across the country as we have with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. Luckily, we have very effective health, medical and response systems, but to be able to anticipate when they need to be activated and the form of their activation is a futures thinking process and it's critical to risk management strategic thinking. Equally, emergent disruptions cause secondary and tertiary effects that feed back on the capacity and capability to deal with ongoing surge, uh, surge issues. There are always preconditions, there's always vulnerabilities and triggering events that can come out of the blue. So we have that surprise management motif in a lot of my thinking and a lot of other people working in this space. We do not want to be surprised, we want to anticipate to the best that we can. Now Australia has strategic uh, strat or strategy on, on national security issues, certainly the image you see there. We've done great work in natural hazards, uh, Mark Croswell's work when he was with uh, Attorney Generals and Home Affairs, looking at risk reduction strategies from a natural hazards perspective, the vulnerability analyses. Also, I'll compare Soros' technical work in vulnerability assessments and value impacts as well. We have a lot of great technique reports and analyses done. They could be better used if we have a strategic approach nationally of how to make use of these sorts of great tools. The UK have a national risk register, the OECD do national risk assessments. One small problem with the UK approach is that this is an assessment of the sorts of uh, disaster events that the country might have to respond to. It's reliant on logarithmic representations of likelihood and, co and consequence. Unfortunately, the probabilities don't relate to enhancing what you need to do to limit the likelihood of the sorts of issues that the risk register talks about. There's a very interesting uh, RUSI uh, document published a few weeks ago that looks at the particular limitations of the National Risk Register from the UK, which I can uh, provide to the organisers of today's event for those who are interested in looking at. It's very, very interesting. 
Other examples from international better practice, any, some work that was done some years ago across the economy or institutions you see on the left-hand column here. One of the critical issues of a risk management strategy, may I suggest, is horizon scanning foresight. What could we be facing? What are the vulnerabilities that are becoming critical? How do we manage, how do we, in an agile context, adapt and limit the likelihood that we will have problems coming? Impact assessments. One of the critical elements of Singapore as a successful megacity is that it's a scale of, it's a size issue for them that they can, they can, uh, they can uh, manifest change very quickly and it's a particular city state. So the mega cities of Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, for example, resilient cities, the Rockefeller Foundation work. Elements of working at a city scale are very amenable to action. A risk management strategy, may I suggest, has to work across city scales at a national level. So there is a way for us to go, but there are indicators that we really would benefit from having such a strategy. Such a strategy would cover many of the things you see in the slides there. There's uh, some better practice and some excellent practice internationally in this respect. So what do we get from a national risk management strategy? We get to map phenomena, we get to see patterns. And this image is a synthesis of the thinking that you could get. So there's a dynamic of scale from the left-hand column. There's a spatial scale in the right-hand column. And you can bring together a range of critical phenomena in a complex interdependent systemic representation of where these disturbances, in this case, the disease emergence in, uh, in an animal health context. But the complexity and the analogy of this image uh, is, is suggestive that the benefits of a risk management strategy that then allows a, an effective coordination and application of the great techniques and talents within various professional groups within the country, if we can combine them together in a strategically focused outcomes oriented capability, the government, governments, both federal, state, local and communities have a better uh, opportunity of being aware what needs to be done and what is being done and effective outcomes to occur. So, uh, national risk management uh, practice. May I suggest one of the benefits is strengthening capability to make timely, appropriate decisions under great degrees of uncertainty. How to contextualize futures thinking, coordinating choices at a whole of economy level that is also spatially related to what happens at the local level. We need to be able to and should be able to inform decisions where we need to most appropriately invest in mitigation, preparation not just response. Emergency response is critical, but if we can prevent the need to have the scale of emergency response by mitigating the likelihood and or consequence of a disturbance by getting ahead of the cave, uh, curve, ahead of the wave and anticipating, we would be better off, I think. And risk management strategy will encourage contestable policy advice, discussions. How can we have national dialogues that are appropriately informed by science appropriately be informed by human and societal need to appropriately and agilely address these issues ahead of the game. And there's a range of threat spaces and risk vectors related and some of those you see in the bottom point. So if we do have a effective strategy and a strategic approach, may I suggest that we will move from, as you see at the left-hand scale, from threat specific responses to multi-hazard scenario thinking. What tasks do we need to address now? What capabilities do we need to invest in and ensure we have on tap? The scale, it has to be multi-scale. We have to think town, city, region, state, nation, and international where relevant. We have to have joined up thinking. We need to have our specialists working in a collective way. This has happened during pandemic response. It needs to be a consistent and stable factor within our governance. We've got to go beyond ad hoc assessments. We have to have systematic assessments where we are vulnerable. Vulnerability assessment is critical to a national risk approach. Functional requirements. What sort of continuity and recovery planning do we need? Proaction. We need to anticipate near and future impacts. We need to understand what collaboration is needed before we have to go into action, so to speak. And we have to have flexibility. We have to anticipate 
we have to have imagination as a critical driver of our thinking. We have to think, where are we vulnerable? What is likely to occur? And are we ready? And how do we test our readiness? And we have to invest in that before we respond because uh, many, many uh, assessors across the planet historically have said, one unit of prevention will give you four to seven units of savings that you would normally apply in a response context. So at the end of the day, we need to anticipate surprise. That's a goal of national risk management. That's a goal of risk assessors. That's a goal of organisations and institutions. Because recent research that's come from our Academy of Science has suggested that a major driver of systems, warming, is something we have to anticipate. Now, this is nothing new. It's been said many times over a long period. But this particular report is suggesting we need to anticipate what we need to do before we are surprised by the effects of such phenomena. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Paul, for a very thorough presentation and some really interesting um, diagrams on the slides. Um, so we'll now move into the Q&A session. And um, just a reminder for, for those of you who put your questions in the chat box, um, if you really want them answered, um, please tr um, put them into the Q&A box. Uh, and we'll just go from the top, the questions that are being um, voted up. So that just changed. Okay. So first question, uh, Paul, looking at your, oh, sorry, um, looking at, at your seven application areas of risk, do you think we concentrate too much um, on the economic lens and the other lenses become subservient to economics? I think economic impact is only one of a major or a series of, of issues that have to be considered. Uh, if we just look at uh, fuel security, for example, high refined fuel security, a, a factor of having the cheapest, most effective cost at the bowser for people to fill their either their diesel vehicles or their petroleum vehicles is a critical factor. But if we don't have supply chain continuity and resilience to provide the refined fuels by ship as we currently have as a reality in Australia, uh, we may not have enough fuel for people to pay the lowest cost at. So economic, economic lenses is one critical lens that we have to look at from a national perspective. But there are other lenses. If we don't have our own refining capacity and we continue to rely on imported fuel, that's a critical meta impact or meta factor that will uh, basically uh, over, overreach and overblunt uh, the issue of economic impact. So there has to be multiple lenses in my view. Thank you. Uh, so next question. A national risk management strategy will not be effective if the pop population is perpetually debilitated from the relentless deterioration of its mental health and well-being resulting from the evolving threat landscape. Um, so the rest is more of a comment. Um, is it not crucial, therefore, for the national risk management strategy not only to be informed by science and a focus on infrastructure systems as outlined in the seminar, but also to be informed by the creative arts with a focus on nurturing social and cultural resilience through the enunciation of community relationships and values as aesthetic narratives that reconcile and heal. John, I fully agree with everything you say in that particular question. Um, if, the, if the audience or the listeners, as Philip Adam would suggest, the listener or the viewer, could hark your mind back to the, the matrix of the seven professional approaches to the concept of risk, starting with actuarial science, the insurance industry, events that occur that have a cost to recover, to repair, all the way through to cultural anthropology and sociology, where we're not looking at the right-hand side in terms of what people's perceptions of risk may be. It's the experience of danger. There's a difference between psychological and psychometric approaches to uh, what do you think about this sort of event if you've never experienced it? The psychological psychometric approach is critical, but when it comes to how people experience danger, culturally how danger is expressed, those factors are critical also to a national approach. Now, 
there's, there's a myriad of professionals and people working with people uh, specifically affected by uh, natural hazards, flood, fire, etc. But the critical issue for me is that any sophisticated and effective risk management strategy has to appreciate that people experience danger, they don't experience risk, which is a a technical tool that we use to assess and manage from a governance perspective. Risk is a very uh, complex phenomena. When it comes to the social, cultural, and anthropological world, we're dealing with belief systems and experience. We're not dealing with uh, objective phenomena. So it's a positivist approach to the world at one end, it's a subjective approach to the other quantitative and qualitative. We need to bring them together, but we have to be aware that people don't experience risk. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and that's a wonderful quote that we experience danger and not risk. And if I was on Twitter, I would tweet that. Um, so thanks for that. But um, I'm sure somebody is tweeting it already, Anna. Hopefully. Um, thank you. And next question, relatively straightforward. What should we expect from the government's 2021 update of the National Climate Resilience and Adaptation Strategy from 2015? Hopefully, a description of agile thinking and engagement. One of the, one of the issues that occurred, and I alluded it to in my, in my words, about the collaboration during the COVID, early COVID times. Uh, in discussions with colleagues within government, there have been groups that have come together last year working collectively that it would never necessarily have come together to work as a team in the past. One of the things that I would like to see from any and all government strategic policy expressions is a recognition that teams are required to deal with the complexity of natural hazards and the cascading and cumulative effects that they trigger. We need multi-lensed thinking unless we can understand the complexity of both cause and effect, likelihood and consequence, and the effects that will come from these exposures and these disturbances, we won't be able to fully and comprehensively think appropriately. So it's got to be, I, I would hope that any future policy uh, enunciation from the government, in agreement with state and federal and local government, of course, is that we have teams, we have multi-lens views. It's not just a linear focused approach to the problem because Einstein had it right. The, the problems that we have to, the, the problem, the, the thinking we cause the problems is inadequate for the thinking that is required to attend to the effects and the problems that are in front of us. So I I'd like to see a, a fuller understanding of, of resilience as it applies across the board. It's resilience is not the opposite of vulnerability. You know, if you reduce vulnerability, you don't enhance resilience. Resilience is very complex. So we, we shouldn't be downplaying the complexity of the ideas, but we should be trying to understand how we communicate the nature of risk. We have to we communicate the limitations of what scientific knowledge can convey. And we have to join policy advisors, policy thinkers with technical thinkers and doers and members of the public that we as public servants uh, serving. Thank you for that. Um, so how well is Australia approaching risk management at the moment, other than its response to COVID? What institutional or organizational change should we be pursu pursuing at a national level? <sighs> An, An easy one for you. A, a light <laughs> question. Uh, as an independent thinker, um, there are a number of things that, have, um, that we have to attend to and we have to continue to have it on, on the front page of, of our book. There's a couple of recent issues that I'll start with. One of the factors, uh, one of the elements of the Bushfire Royal Commission recently completed and the many recommendations is the, the notion of positioning disaster risk reduction and resilience building as, a, as an issue within Premier and Cabinet, a uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet, sorry. So the new institution that's being set up, hopefully will be as complex, well, not as complex, but as uh, we'll have a, 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 uh, a term of reference applied and allowed to it that is comprehensive enough to meet what was recommended in the Royal Commission. The other issue that we'll have a national research centre 
for natural hazards and resilience enhancement. I would hope that the government recognises that that will be a critical breakthrough creation for the country. But there has to be really strong links with our state-based universities where we have a sunk cost, we have a deep capability. We have research centres at some of them, like the one that we're working through today that Anna is representing. We have some other uh, research institutes, the Torrens Resilience Institute, uh, Mudri at Monash. We don't have enough of those type of core clearinghouse active centres. Now, our universities are there, they have the capability, they have the capacity. One of the future steps needs to be nationally, we coordinate to the degree most appropriate to the country's needs with our deep, well-invested university bases. The universities have so much, so much skill, so much uh, potential to be heard and be active. We need to make sure that the National Research Centre and the universities work really well together. And that is something that can be directed by national strategy. So there are future things that I think I'm positive about. There are some things that will be revolutionary and some things that I've written last year about things being evolutionary, which is not as good as revolution. Thank you for that. Um, so what methods and or perspectives would you suggest to individuals seeking to increase their mental resilience to anticipation of increasing risks of natural hazards and irrevocable impact of climate change to environmental systems? Well, Dean, I'm not a, a, a mental health specialist. I'm an environmental toxicologist and risk assessor built on with emergency management. But can I suggest that uh, uh, the effects of disasters? Uh, in my early research, I looked at uh, uh, the beliefs of operational firefighters in terms of the dangers that they faced on a daily and nightly basis. Not rural firefighters, but urban firefighters. And I rode fire trucks for a year with a group of firefighters going to every event that they went to on one day a week and the next week a night event. And I experienced a range of um, unusual phenomena for a researcher. You normally don't get to sit with an operational team that goes into danger all the time. And can I suggest that the issue of professionals responding to danger, police, paramedics, ambulance, military, firefighters, SES, rural firefighters, emergency responders in medical, um, medical emergency responders in hospitals. You become familiar with the stress and you can become hardened to that stress, but you have a professional mental focus and application of skill sets. If you contrast that to members of the public who are inadvertently exposed to danger and the stresses of a bushfire, the sound of a bushfire approaching, the heat, the ambient heat, that's enough to worry people, let alone losing livelihoods, losing, losing their history. So I can't speak to the techniques, but all I can suggest is that there needs to be continued and ongoing support of those who know how to do it these things and support people in need. But equally, the professionals sometimes can't be stoic as a professional responder. You, you know, there's been a lot of help provided over many years, in recent years, to the stressors or to respond to the stressors of emergency response. We need to also be, be aware that there are vulnerabilities across society and uh, support those people who can support those in need. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Noting that we already have a national disaster risk reduction framework, national climate and resilience strategy and other similar documents, how would you expect a national risk strategy to marry these approaches, especially when different areas of government and the private sector can be protective of their portfolios? Again, a very, very simple question, Christian, one of which uh, it's probably the last part of the question is for the government to answer. Maybe you should ask someone in government, rhetorically, but you've asked me. Um, one of the things that's missing, and I'll refer you back to the RUSI document on the national, UK National Risk Register, is that in some cases, the assessments of risk that you will find in the way the UK system is operating is a snapshot in time, and it's on a logarithmic scale. So, it doesn't necessarily tell you, give you much information where you can imagine or anticipate 
when such a phenomenon of disturbance that's on the matrix will occur. It just tells you in a comparative scale related to the other elements that they've got on their matrix, a risk register, so to speak, a risk matrix, low to high. It just suggests uh, a snapshot in time and an assumption that the statistical rendering of the relationships and the phenomena, be it a flood, be it a, a cyber breakdown, for example, has a certain severity. It doesn't tell you anything about like the one in 100 year flood issues that have been spoken about in the, the recent flooding in New South Wales and other places. It doesn't tell you anything about how likely, other than the fact that this is a representation of a very infrequent large scale event. So one of the issues with all the techniques is that it needs to be joined together. They need to be joined together. The pillars of excellence, and I'm not being facetious, there are great skill sets. Uh, Geosciences Australia, the, the, the Met Bureau, other agencies. And I know Home Affairs is very seriously looking at a range of enhancement of skill sets in terms of risk assessment and other agencies within federal government and state governments as well. But there needs to be a cohesive top cover policy statement. This is how we'll join together all these techniques. This is how we'll move forward with all these frameworks that are critically important, the ones you've referenced and the ones I've mentioned, and many of the others that I haven't had time to refer to. There is great skill set, but we need to orchestrate in the full sense of an orchestra with a baton through policy, through strategy, about how we'll use those great frameworks and how we'll use the great expertise. We don't have the orchestra, or at least we don't have the conductor. We've got the orchestra. Thank you for that wonderful imagery. Um, so the next question, um, Paul, scientists have not managed to communicate to government what the real risks of glo global warming are. And now IPCC seem to have only propose action with 66% chance of success, whereas in engineering, we insist on 99.99 reliability. Is there a clue in your danger versus risk comments on how we communicate with government to get them to understand? That was a sigh. Very, very good question, Steve. One of the critical issues that I've, uh, in my experience working as a corporate risk manager within state government, as, as, a, uh, as a community safety manager within fire and rescue, uh, as working in defence in terms of advice in national security, defence security, and as an academic and as a, uh, as a think tank, uh, member of a think tank looking at contestable advice to government and anyone else that would read. I've come to the conclusion that one of the critical issues, and I alluded to it in that matrix of, you know, actuarial science to socio-cultural anthropological approaches, is that language is critical as is experience. If I'm trying to communicate to somebody the nature of what might occur if, there were, if we're looking at a disease causation process in animals, there needs to be a set of steps that increase the likelihood that some sort of contagious phenomena, some contagion, could be anthrax spores, could be buried carcass from 70 years ago in the countryside. Cattle died with anthrax infection. Two weeks ago, cattle started falling over. It was discovered it was anthrax. Is it, where's the source of the anthrax? Was it related to the drought? Was it related to the animals digging up the ground, exposing the old carcasses from 70 years ago where there are still spores that have gone into hibernation, very complex biology, opened up to moisture and atmosphere, the spores then activate causing a disease process. The spores become a risk factor by environmental phenomena. How do you explain, and I've done this for real, I've spoken to people at different parts of government from the policing side and the other, other sides of government about what happened in a particular case of cattle contracting anthrax. Was it a natural source or was it a non-natural human supported or created source? The uncertainty about whether it could be one or the other has to be very clear. The complexity that we were faced with, that I was faced with in that instance, was that our, when I was working with Primary Industries Queensland, our field vets had confirmed without a doubt where the smoking gun came from. It was a 70 year old carcass exposed uh, by cattle living. They contacted, they, they broke through the thoracic cavity, 
the skeletal remains, the spores, sporulated, causing the disease. So it was a natural cause. Sometimes the uncertainty of cause and effect has to be clear by as much technical knowledge as we can garner. So it's a science based what we know, and what we don't know. The critical interface between science and science can't tell you everything. Science can tell you to the basis of our knowledge and analysis, this is what we think is going to happen. Most of the time, if you're lucky, you can get up to that point. This is what we think on the basis of our evidence and our and analytics. Sometimes science can't go beyond that. The complexity of policy is that policy sometimes and decision making related to policy requires accuracy that sometimes science cannot give. So the reality is that there is an interface between expectations of that, what the knowledge can convey to decision makers and policy creators. So the risk communication has to be really clear. There has to be understanding from the policy interface to our elected officials about what science and other technology providers can say, what they can say with accuracy and degrees of accuracy. So there has to be a better interface and relationship in terms of understanding and knowledge assessment between policy advisors and those who are providing knowledge for the policy advisors to explain to our elected officials. In some cases, that is a very crowded interface that's murky and isn't clear. So one of the critical things is communication across different tribal groups. Policy thinkers are not toxicologists. Elected officials are not toxicologists. You've seen it in COVID, a range of engagement and community, communities of interest at the elected official level, decision-making level. Lots of people working together. That's the sort of thing that has to be preserved, but we have to understand and practice doing it well, because there may not be, uh, there may be a range of other threats manifesting that have to be really effectively worked on. But if we can, if we can predict, uh, sorry, we can, uh, if we can put in a can the skill sets of communication under crisis at the senior decision levels that we've had over the last year and had that ready for different types of threats, we may be better off. We need a management strategy that defines how, well, that, that, that sort of uh, practice needs to be preserved. Clear policy, clear strategic directives, make it happen. That's what we need okay. to do. Thank you. Um, and there's always the danger that elected official may, may choose to under, uh, may understand and choose to ignore or bypass an, an issue. Critical. Um, That's critical yep. that the decision makers also, at the end of the day, have the responsibility to make these decisions on behalf of the elect, uh, those who elected them. All I'm saying is that in some cases, we have to make it very clear and it may be murky. Yep. And um, the next question is... Um, um, leading to, uh, to, to that conversation as well. Um, how can we teach people to think about the unforeseen? Well, if we can teach school children how to stop, drop and roll and get down low and go, go, go in bush in fires and situations, we start at all levels. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues there of communicating the unforeseen is, is not just fire safety, which has worked over the years across the country and in many other places uh, around the globe. Um, one of the one of the uh, one of the viewers. I'm not sure if um, if you're on the, the session today. Uh, works in the SES in Southeast Queensland. I won't mention his name because, uh, although his name is Graham, uh, talked about the issue of communicating effectively to people, not just about acute response, as in there's a bushfire in a nearby situation, you have to be ready to evacuate, etc. In some cases, you need to have multiple languages. It has to be written, possibly. Uh, some cases, uh, people are not on the internet, they may not have a digital phone that can have a warning communicated or triggered on for them. So there needs to be a range of ways in which we can communicate ahead of an emergency, ahead of a crisis. But uh, I think it starts with younger people, and it has, there has to be communication strategies related to uh, uh, informing people, understanding uh, what uh, individual community needs are. In some cases, people may be immigrants. They've experienced these dangers where they were before they came to, to Australia. So harness the knowledge of communities. 
engage with communities, talk to them. Now, these things have been done for the last umpteen years with our fire services and others. We just need to keep doing it. We need to review whether some other techniques may be effective, but we can't give up on engaging, talking about prevention, anticipation, the things that may occur. Uh, because we, we know that there are vulnerabilities and we know that there are risk vectors that increase the likelihood and consequence of phenomena. So we have to understand, I think we just have to continue doing what we've done. And in some cases, see what works and what could be done better. But engaging with everybody in appropriate ways, in various forms, written, digital, face to face. Thank you. So why don't we have a national climate risk assessment? Is there a disincentive for the government to have the science to be accountable to? Hannah, I would ask the same question and I don't really have an answer. Um, through the, the, the sorts of issues, you know, the university I work with currently has a, a national cooperative research centre into climate. Um, ANU has great, great depth and skills and, and knowledge uh, and expertise. It comes back, I think, to being aware of the expertise that Australia has. Just talking about Australia. Uh, you could ask the same question, a national energy security assessment. We've been waiting a number of years for that. Um, again, you know, I'm not being critical of the government, the public servants who have done the work in this area, very experienced and very useful stuff. But it's up to the government of the day to decide when these sorts of reports are released or how they want to work from a policy perspective. So I can't really talk about uh, why we haven't done these things. I know the, the public servants that have worked in these areas are doing really good work, very, exper uh, very experienced. But we have to, I think, change the way the country is thinking about what is urgent and what is not urgent. Um, the metaphor of the frog in the beaker of hot water underneath the Bunsen burner in the, the high school or the university laboratory, if it warms up slowly, the animal doesn't appreciate that it could be in metaphorical, literal hot water. If we're looking at complex adaptive systems, and we have to look at these sorts of systemic thinking elements if we're dealing with national risk issues and being able to adapt ahead of the time. You may find that there is a minor trigger of some phenomena within the environment that causes cascading, immediate cascading effects, or it could be a very slow curve, a cusp failure that is not really sudden. If we look at some of the uh, maritime currents that are happening, say, uh, the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, there's a lot of evidence coming out in the scientific literature about potential changes and redirection of the currents. The currents, water temperature, and other really large biological meta global phenomena influence weather systems and slash climate systems. We've had La Nina manifesting in Australia, lots of water as a result. What are we sensitive to? What does Australia need to be worried about from a threat and the complex adaptive systems propagation mechanisms that come from those threats? Are the systems driven by heat? If we look at entropy, simple physics, heat and cold, the more it gets cold, certain things happen in the environment. If it gets warm, certain things happen in the environment. Weather patterns, climate patterns are affected by warming. It doesn't matter where they're coming from. It's just a phenomenon that's occurring. And we have to adapt to complex systems. So the, cre the, the reality is, is that Australia needs to think about what it needs to worry about across the board. And it needs a comprehensive approach and a sophisticated, not complicated approach to thinking about risk management. We've got the skills, the governments have the skills, government employees, public servants have the skills, universities definitely have the skills, private sector have the skills. We need to join together. We need to have an orchestrated approach. And on that, the next question is, can you make a comment on the relationship between risk and resilience? Thank you, uh, Jason, uh, International Chair of the International Standards on Risk Management, ISO 31000, etc. Jason, my view is risk is a phenomenon that is beset by complexity and uncertainty. It's a relationship between what could occur, that is, either intended, if it's a positive business planning risk assessment, or what might occur that is a negative 
consequence, a disturbance. And historically, uh, we can go all the way back to Chinese uh, characters, pictograms, uh, all the way back to Egyptian hieroglyphics. And certain researchers from the ANU, Anna, uh, published work some years ago looking at language and the way in which various language groups historically through time spoke about these things. And they went into looking at uh, uh, a range of language groups from North Africa coming into Spain, uh, the influence of uh, Muslim culture, Muslim science and mathematics into uh, the high culture of Europe. And it talked about how language through uh, Spanish, German, Italian morphed and talked about different ways of expressing uncertainty, risk and impact, whether it's sourced by human endeavour, whether it was meta-human, whether it's from uh, a sense of a higher self or, or fate. So the language of risk has been very, very complex and international standards are very hard to do. And uh, I know that it's very complex to bring uh, standards that are useful uh, into being. So risk for me is a, a likelihood consequence phenomenon. It's Cartesian, but vulnerability is critical to it. Uncertainty of data, different ways of looking at the phenomena. If you're an uh, insurance specialist, you might call a risk a peril which is quite different to what uh, an epidemiologist might look at in terms of relative risks or odds ratios. Again, different applications of science using the same words. So language is critical. So if we look again, uncertainty impacts what we can know and how we approach this notion of likelihood and consequence of future events. At the same time, uncertainty impacts how we look at business planning about do we then apply and invest in this particular type of activity because we have a return of investment that's predicted, we have data. In many cases, our business colleagues doing prospective positive risk assessment that then informs business decisions have a vast database that they can work to. And they're working in systems that are reasonably well known in terms of how uh, economic systems will occur. Although relying on statistical analyses to uh, you know, if, if you, you, know, you can't torture the data until it confesses, you have to understand some element of the system that your data is being applied to. So risk is, for me, uh, a complex phenomena. Uh, it's, it's mired in uncertainty. It's mired in likelihood and consequence. It's mired in understanding vulnerabilities, etc. Resilience. If you do risk assessment well and you can, you know, move the ship of state between the, the icebergs and not be disturbed or have minimal disturbance, you may be able to have a phenomena that I call resilience. Resilience for me is a systems, a meta systems concept. Um, it's, if you look at Buzz Holling's early ecological work, resilience is a stability regime. Your rainforest is a rainforest because it has certain phenomena related to it. It rains, it has certain age related cumulative elements within the ecosystem. If the rainfall stops, there's a net reduction in a major stability factor of that system, rainforest. If the rain stops, it may change its nature as a forest to be a different set of species in the rainforest, different animals. The ground litter may change. The, the species as you move up from the ground to the crown of the forest may change. So changing certain factors change the resilience of the rainforest. If you look at a human approach to resilience, many, many uh, commentators, and there's been a myriad, as you know, as the listener or the viewer knows, uh, those who look at the literature, lots of people talking about resilience. Can we come back to being resilient after disturbance? If you look at the Holling approach, the technical ecological systems approach, you may come back to a relatively stable position, but it may not be what it was before. You can't come back to the past necessarily. You can come back to a new set of norms, a new stability setting. So resilience for me is reasonably a balanced system, a stable set of phenomena. And the critical thing, uh, I think, from an Australian perspective, is that if we look at national resilience, we have to understand how we would create or recreate some degree of stability. So resilience is a systems concept for me that is uh, that it manifests if we get our risk assessment and our risk management right. Because if we can understand what could occur that we can avoid, we will have less problems with our stability, therefore our resilience. So good risk assessment, 
supported by good risk management policy and orchestral, orchestral uh, conducting will allow the country systems people to be resilient because it allows us to avoid to the degree we can and mitigate consequences of disturbances. Thank you for that um, very thorough answer. Now, we still have 11 questions um, on the screen, uh, but it, it, we've reached 1.30 now, so um, we, um, uh, we will be answering the rest by email. Isn't, isn't that right, Paul? I'm happy to do that, or I'm happy to take one more if we have time. Um, we, we, we should probably uh, wrap up the... Um, um, yes, because the uh, next couple of questions will require um, more detailed answers than simply um, a sentence or two. So uh, Paul will attend to the unanswered questions um, um, as a written res response, which we will also make available um, on our website. Um, so I would really like to thank um, all the attendants for their questions and Paul for um, his very thorough answers. Um, and a quick reminder that this event um, has been recorded. It will be available um, for viewing on the ICETS YouTube ch channel in the um, next few days, um, along with the written responses to the questions we didn't get to. Um, thank you again to all the attendees. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Um, and once again, thank you for, uh, to Paul for making himself available for this event. And we'll wrap it up here and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to ANU. Uh, and I appreciate the time. Uh, it's a great target to, to look at, a topic, I should say. Uh, and I think it's very timely. And um, again, everybody who sent messages and made comments, Thank you, uh, and I'll do my best to answer them to the degree that I'm able, uh, some of which I won't be able to, some will be just uh, based on um, experience and the collective thought. But again, from my perspective, Anna, and to ANU, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. How was that?